Hello. Does this work? It does work. Thank you very much for coming. Good evening. Good evening and Happy New Year. Welcome to the Independence Historical Trust Legacy Award Gala. My name is Tom Karamanico. I am the Volunteer Executive Director of Independence Historical Trust. I've been on the board of the trust for about 20 years. Uh, last several years, we've had tremendous or, uh, events like this, and I, it's, it's really a testament to those of you who've been supporting us for some time. So we appreciate it very much. I want to thank the, the uh, National Constitution Center for allowing us to be here tonight. I love this building. I've always loved this building. I just want to tell you one thing about this building, two things, actually. Um, uh, building opened in 2003. But if you remember the uh, anniversary of the Constitution, the 200th anniversary of the Constitution was in 1987. The Constitution was signed in 1787. And so some people at the park, Independence Historical Park said, we ought to do something for the 200th anniversary. So they asked the trust, then known as the Friends of Independence Park, to help them put together an exhibit. Uh, we worked with people at the park, put together some sort of an exhibit. I'm not even sure where it was shown, somewhere in the park. Uh, we did some educational materials, um, and apparently, I wasn't around at the time, I wasn't on the board, but apparently a very well-received exhibit about the 200th anniversary of the Constitution. And somebody, some important person, decided this should be a permanent exhibit. Somebody should do something permanent with all this stuff. It was sent around the country, and the, most, the, the important person who thought that had some important people he knew who went out and raised the money and created this building, created the National Constitution Center. So we weren't involved in creating the National Constitution Center. We weren't involved in raising the money, thank God. Uh, but, <laughs> but we were there at the, at the inception of the idea for the National Constitution Center. The second little piece of trivia that I just read about last night, the address of this building is 525 Arch Street. Um, and the reason it's 525, it takes up the whole block, it could be any number. It's 525 because the day that the Constitutional Convention convened in 1787 was May 25th, 525. Now, I, I thought I was gonna give that credit to the, somebody at the post office who knew that, but I saw Vince Stango here tonight. Vince is the COO of, uh, of the Constitution Center. He said he was the one who told the post office that's the address we want. <laughs> Tonight, uh, as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of Independence, Historical Park, Independence National Historical Park, we honor a figure of immense stature in the world of history and culture, Dr. Henry Louis Gates. Dr. Gates' work has profoundly, profoundly improved our understanding of American history, particularly through the lens of African American experiences. His scholarship, documentaries, and writings have not only educated, but also inspired countless individuals. This celebration of Dr. Gates tonight is not just about reflecting on the past, but also about embracing our future with, en with enthusiasm, purpose, and inclusiveness. Before we get to the conversation we're gonna have with Dr. Gates, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank our sponsors and attendees for supporting the trust and the work that we do as a philanthropic partner. Thank you especially to M&T Bank um, for being our lead sponsor. I also want to thank our honorary committee members led by Chair Greg Devins from Independence Blue Cross. In addition, the trust could not... <laughs> In addition, the trust could not achieve its mission without an extremely dedicated board of directors led by our chair, Bill Morazzo, uh, and, and and, and many of our board members and staff are here tonight. You'll see them, they have a name tag that has some kind of uh, uh, identifiable notice that they are a staff member or a board member. We appreciate all the things that they do. Since 1972, the Independence Historical Trust has been a steadfast supporter of Philadelphia's National Park. Our mission is not just preservation, but also the enhancement of the experience for visitors and residents alike. This commitment has led us to embark on ambitious capital improvement projects within Philadelphia's historic district. These projects, including our current portfolio comprising the restoration of the First Bank of the United States and the creation of Tamanen Plaza and the reimagining of Wilson Park at Second and Market Streets, 
They're not only about restoring bricks, mortar, and an urban green space, they're about reinvigorating the spirit and narrative of our nation's history. And they endeavor to tell the story of our founding era with a wide ranging and more inclusive lens. The First Bank exhibits, for instance, tell the story of how Alexander Hamilton's vision of how a national bank spurred growth in the early American economy. These exhibits also discuss the difficult truths of how the bank's policies and the policies of our young nation perpetuated the institution of slavery and helped to displace Native Americans. Wilson Park and Tamanen Plaza tell a more comprehensive story of the Native people of this land when William Penn first arrived in 1682. A statue of Chief Tamanen, the chief who signed a treaty with William Penn, already exists down near Second and Market. We're working with the city of Philadelphia to improve the intersection of Second and Market where we will tell the story about Chief Tamanen. While there's a statue, the story's not told. And so we're gonna tell that story in a more inclusive way at Second and Market and in Wilson Park. We're also working with the city of Philadelphia on improvements to Market Street from 2nd Street to 6th Street, improvements to 6th Street from Race to Chestnut, pedestrian improvements to Commerce Street between 5th and 3rd and other areas. I can't share more details about these now, but you'll begin to hear more information about these this year. And just next week, we're meeting with park leadership to talk about some important accessibility improvements behind Independence Hall inside the park. More on that later as well. These efforts wouldn't be possible, wouldn't be possible without the generous support of individuals like you who understand the importance of preserving our shared history and improving the experience for those who visit here. And of course, we cannot do any of this work without the help of the incredible staff of Independence National Historical Park. In a few minutes, you'll hear from our gala honorary chair, Greg Devins of, of Independence Blue Cross, and then you'll hear from the trust board chairman, Bill Morazzo, CEO of WHYY. But before I introduce them, I wanna recognize just a couple of people. I think Sheila Hess is here. Sheila Hess. <laughs> and Sheila Hess, who, if not the current and immediately past city representative, the best city representative that the city of Philadelphia's ever had. And we also have representing Senator Nicholas Saval, we have George Donnelly, who is uh, from the Chief of Staff. But now I'm thrilled to introduce to you, to welcome the new superintendent of, of Independence Park, Steve Sims. Superintendent Sims brings a wealth of experience and a fresh perspective to our cherished park. Steve served here at Independence Park more than 10 years ago, and then he was promoted as superintendent of several lesser parks at Valley Forge and Gettysburg. Uh, before returning here as the superintendent, we need to lead us to the future. His vision and leadership will be pivotal as we move forward in enhancing the park's role in our local community and in the upcoming 250th celebration of the Declaration of Independence. Steve, please come up and say a few words. Lesser Parks. Thank you, Tom. Well, good evening. It is so good to be here, to be back in Philly, back at Independence National Historical Park, and here with all of you this evening. I'd also like to thank a few folks. Thank you to uh, Bill Morazzo and the Board of the Trust. Thank you, Tom, and the staff of the Trust, Maddie, Jonathan, Natasha, for all your work, and uh, thank you to Greg Devins and the Gala Committee for all their work to bring us together this wonderful evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Independence National Historical Park. Established by Congress in June of 1948, we celebrate 75 years as a unit of the National Park Service, created to protect the historic places associated with the birth of the American Republic, standing as icons of freedom and democratic ideals for the people around the world. Here at Independence National Historical Park, our mission is to preserve and protect 
the National Parks of Philadelphia in perpetuity and to provide for visitor education and enjoyment. We cannot fulfill our mission without our partnership with Independence Historical Trust. For a city that loves its firsts, here's a bit of trivia for you. Independence Historical Trust has the notable distinction of being the first friends group of a national park unit. The National Park Service highly values the partnership we have with the Trust because it allows us to better preserve and protect these national parks for the education and enjoyment of our visitors. Simply put, we are stronger together. Currently, we are working together on several projects, including the rehabilitation of the Benjamin Rush Garden. This project includes the rehabilitation of the Bicentennial Bell, a gift from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Rehabilitation of the First Bank, as Tom mentioned, built in 1797, established as a National Historic Landmark. This building tells the story of Alexander Hamilton's establishment of the nation's currency, the federal tax system, and the federal government's first fiscal agent. Rehabilitation of the Declaration House, also known as the Graff House, the site of the reconstructed home of bricklayer Jacob Graff, who rented out a room to Thomas Jefferson and his enslaved servant, Robert Hemings, to draft the timeless Declaration of Independence, declaring all men are created equal, and indelibly securing our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The historic buildings and landscapes that comprise of the 54 acres of Philadelphia's national parks have a multitude of stories related to the founding of the United States, stories that reflect the successes and struggles of establishing our democracy. It is fitting that we are honoring Dr. Gates tonight because he brings to light the stories of our nation. He plants the seed and gives us reason to take a moment to pause for reflection, for introspection. He helps us to see our nation and ourselves as at our best and at our worst. That is what the National Park Service does as well. We share America's stories that absolutely cameo the best aspects of America, but don't ignore the worst. To borrow some words from Dr. Gates himself, America is the greatest nation ever founded. The ideals are the greatest espoused in human history, and we just need to live up to them. And that is exactly what Independence National Historical Park strives to do every day. With the help of the trust and the millions of visitors who come to see where the founding ideals of our nation were birthed and where many of America's collective symbols of freedom and democracy still reside. Again, welcome to Independence National Historical Park, your park, America's park. Our next speaker was gracious enough to be the chair of the Legacy Award Gala, Mr. Greg Devins. Greg is the CEO of Independence Blue Cross, a company that has called Philadelphia home since 1938, always working to further their mission to improve the health and well-being of our community. Please join me in a round of applause for Greg Devins. Well, good evening, everyone. You're a great looking group this evening. It really is a pleasure for me to be here with, with all of you and certainly a privilege to serve as tonight's honorary chair. It's especially meaningful as we wrap up the 75th anniversary year of Independence National Historical Park. And congratulations to Superintendent Sims and the Independence National Historical Park team. On behalf of all of my colleagues at Independence Blue Cross, and we're celebrating, as was noted, our own 85th anniversary as Philadelphia's hometown health insurer. I want to thank everyone who made this incredible night possible. That includes my fellow honorary committee members, the outstanding board of the Independence Historical Trust, led by Bill Marazzo, and the hardworking professional team that keeps the trust moving forward each and every day. So please join me in saluting these dedicated leaders. Thank you. 
You know, Independence National Historical Park is one of Philadelphia's greatest assets. It's the beating heart of this nation. The park is a major attraction for people visiting our great city from all over the world, but it's also for the locals visiting this one-of-a-kind neighborhood. My wife Beverly and I live in the, in the neighborhood just a few blocks away, and we relocated to Philadelphia about seven years ago, and we quickly discovered the joys of walking through this area, and whenever we do, it's an awesome reminder of the history of our nation's founding. Visitors to Independence National Historical Park interact with that story in unique and priceless ways each and every day. And that's why we support the Independence Historical Trust. And I offer my deep, deep gratitude to all of you for doing the same this evening. The work of the Trust is going to be even more critical over the next couple of years I'm honored to serve as the, on the Commission for America 250 Pennsylvania and to help bring, uh, build the momentum for our celebration of the nation's 250th birthday. Yes. And I remember as a kid in 1976, we were celebrating another anniversary. It just tells how old I am. But, but, you know, I think this celebration is going to be like nothing we've seen before. We'll be hosting that same year the World Cup. Yes, absolutely. The Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Yes, absolutely. And also celebrating our nation's 250th uh, anniversary and, and all of the history that is part of this great country. So thanks to the trust and with all of your support, Independence National Historical Park will be ready for another close-up for the world to see. So I'm really excited about it. I could not close, I could not go home, I'll say, without closing my remarks with just a few words about our Legacy Award recipient for this evening. Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. is the perfect honoree for the Independence Historical Trust because he has helped bring the history to life for vast audiences all over this, this country. His books and documentary films tell our American story in a powerful way, often with a particular focus on the African American experience. I recently learned of his efforts to edit and help publish The Bond Woman's Narrative, which scholars now believe to be the very first novel by an African American woman by the name of Hannah Crafts. And he's been a, a, an incredible servant leader to numerous cultural and social organizations focused on building a better nation. Here in Philadelphia, we're lucky to be the home base for Finding Your Roots, his fascinating and moving series on genealogy and genetics, and it's one of my wife and I's favorite uh, shows, so we watch it every time we get a chance to. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Professor Gates shortly, and I want to thank him for his outstanding, impactful, and moving body of work. But now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the chair of Independence Historical Trust and the president and CEO of WHYY, Bill Marazzo. Greg, I love, I love it when people watch TV 12. You know? <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, here we go. Uh, let, let me add my, uh, my thanks. Uh, to each and every one of you for joining the Independence Historical Trust this evening uh, for this very special occasion. <clears throat> it is a complete honor for me to serve uh, on this board and as its chair uh, in service to my uh, director colleagues uh, and frankly with them uh, to serve the remarkable richness uh, of our city's cultural and historical heritage. This is a very big deal. Uh, many of us in this room, show of hands, get to call Philadelphia home. Hey, look at Turn around. Look at this. That's uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, uh, and it's pretty incredible uh, for each and every one of us uh, to have as the backdrop uh, of our 
home and our neighborhood, the Independence National Historic Park. Pretty, pretty remarkable, Steve. Uh, so the trust remains steadfast for all the obvious reasons and our purpose of, of uh, making sure that the, the park, uh, as well as the vibrant community that surrounds this park, Callow Hill, Chinatown, Society Hill, Old City, uh, each of those zip codes uh, add richness and a contemporary flair uh, to what is uh, uh, the nation's only assembly of genuine historic assets uh, marking uh, uh, the institution of freedom. So today uh, and this evening, the honor falls to me as chair to introduce to you uh, personally our legacy awardee and as well as the moderator of this evening's program. Uh, but I, uh, uh, before I do, I'd like to extend uh, my version of a warm thank you to the National Constitution Center, in particular Vince Stango. V Vince, are you in the room? For, for hosting us all this evening. Uh, and, and Steve, to the National Park Service and to your park. Uh, it is the only park, Steve. Uh, congratulate you on your anniversary, and Greg, on, on yours as well. Uh, but Steve, uh, our thanks as a trust uh, go to you and your colleagues for the privilege of, of serving uh, the mission of the Independence National Historic Park. That is a privilege that we hold very tightly and very seriously, so thank you for that. Uh, yeah, rightfully, uh, there was a shout out before, but I'll amplify it again for our small but mighty staff. Uh, you know, Maddie, Jonathan, Natasha, and Tom do a remarkable job. Uh, it enables us as, as uh, trustees to know uh, that not only is the trust as an enterprise uh, viable, but sustainable and growing in a way that we can fulfill uh, our mission and the mission of pridefulness for our home's uh, historic area. I'd like my colleagues on the board to stand and receive your applause and recognition of their volunteer service, Karen, Adrian. Amazing, I see a few of our board colleagues who came, drank, and bolted. <laughs> but they are a remarkable cadre of, of uh, caring civic leaders. And like so many others in this town, uh, we're fortunate to have their volunteer service. And then uh, finally, to each of you, uh, uh, as Tom mentioned, you have our profound and sincere thanks for uh, not only your financial contributions that made this evening a success, but for your caring of the well-being of uh, our city's historic area. As a, as a quick aside, we've, we've made more than a quarter of a million dollars on this evening's event alone, so thank you for all of that. So this prestigious Legacy Award is given to a person who exhibits outstanding vision, innovation, hard work, and extraordinary achievement of their own in the United States of America. The recognition pays tribute to the legacy of our nation, from which its founders met here in 1776 to declare themselves a free and independent nation but to the people who found inspiration here in their fight for basic human rights, uh, the work of our founders uh, also exhibited a remarkable contribution that have discounted uh, uh, the needs and, and, and uh, uh, the public policies that have finally come to the fore as we grapple uh, with their permission of issues of slavery, uh, the prostitution compromising of indigenous rights uh, and over, overlooking uh, the need for gender equality. So as we admire the contributions of our founders, it's also critical as a trust, as a body politic, as a city, as a nation, uh, that we also think about and work on the shortcomings of the founding of our nation to understand how we can promote a much more 
inclusive society for all Americans. With that as background, tonight we have the distinct honor of presenting the Legacy Award to a man whose work examines the many contradictions that exist in our country today and the contradictions around which this country was founded. Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr., otherwise known warmly as Skip, has dedicated his life to uncovering and sharing the stories of our past through his groundbreaking series, Finding Your Roots. Anybody other than Beverly and Greg ever watch it? <laughs> I'll tell you, in this market, it beats Sesame Street in the morning. His show, with its exploration of genealogy and identity, be beautifully ties into the ideals that the Independence National Historic Park represents. Freedom, diversity, and the pursuit of one's heritage. Skip's life work, however, is why Dr. Gates is deserving the Legacy Award. Uh, he's an American literary critic. He's a scholar. He's a professor, he's a historian, and a filmmaker who serves as the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and the director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Amongst his many prestigious recognitions by our country, in 2011, he even had his portrait hung in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. As you'll see in a few minutes, I bet you he's the best dressed guy hanging on that wall. <laughs> so Dr. Gates's work has not only enlightened us about our personal histories, but has also reminded us of the interconnectedness of each of us in our nation. Through his meticulous research and storytelling, he has shown that the quest for independence is not limited to the pages of our history books, but lives within each of us, waiting to be discovered. So tonight, we extend our heartfelt congratulations to Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. as we present him with the Legacy Award, his dedication to uncovering the past and promoting the importance of heritage aligns seamlessly with the mission of the Independence Historical Trust. We thank him for his invaluable contributions to our understanding of history and the enduring legacy of the Independence National Historic Park. Before I invite Skip out here, uh, let me call to the stage this evening's moderator, a colleague and a dear friend of mine. Uh, she's an award-winning journalist with remarkable capacity as a dynamic speaker in her own right, a trainer as well as a program host. Whether on or off air, Tracy has engaged in discussions with some of the world's most dynamic personalities. Tom Brokaw, former British Prime Minister Theresa May, Equal, Just, uh, Equal Justice Initiative founder Brian Stevenson. And with the tip of the, of the hat, I guess, to this evening's program, the likes of historians like John Meacham, as well as tonight's Legacy Award winner, uh, Skip Gates. Ladies and gentlemen, Tracy Matasak. And Craig, I wonder if you might join me on the stage. Uh, what you? Is that that guy? Don't get your fingerprints on. No. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, please help me and Greg and Tracy in welcoming to the stage this evening's Legacy Award winner, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Skip. Skip, uh, 
I think every single one of us is very proud, uh, very excited, very honored uh, to be in your company this evening. Um, it seems to me at a time when the polarization within our nation, uh, if not in the world, uh, seems to be reaching yet another forensic level. Uh, it's a huge point of comfort for any of us as American citizens to know that at least one person is so beautifully focused on exploring how the differences amongst us can enrich us. So uh, with it, our nation, uh, this city, this uh, group of Philadelphia citizens, uh, it's our collective honor uh, to recognize your service to our nation with the Trust Legacy Award, sir, for all that you do for our country and how well you do it. Congratulations. nice. Thank you all for welcoming me so warmly, because it's cold outside, <laughs> and I appreciated that. It is indeed, and we're going to get this in before the snow comes. Thank you all for being with us this evening. I don't know about you, but I'm so looking forward to this conversation with Dr. Henry Louis Gates, who, by the way, gave me permission to call him Skip. I am not being disrespectful. He told me I could call I did him indeed. that. So, Skip, congratulations on winning the Legacy Award, and to echo the others, thank you so much for all the work that you have done to help us have a fuller understanding of our personal and collective legacies. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been fun. I only do it because it makes me feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care about humanity. I don't care about any of you people. <laughs> all the stuff Bill said is total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, congratulations on the start of season 10 of Finding Your yeah. Roots. It aired this week. Thank you. On WHYY, PBS. It's a miracle. So let's, why don't we start there? Because you have researched the ancestry of so many people and people that we feel like we know. Harry Connick Jr., Viola Davis, um, Christiane Amanpour, Gail King. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I wonder if you could just kind of take us behind the scenes of Finding Your Roots and give us some sense of what it requires <laughs> to pull together that information for each guest every week. It requires an army. Yeah. You know, we have uh, fabulous um, genealogists, fabulous um, researchers, and geneticists now. Mm -hmm. So that if we did your family tree, uh, you would, we would send you a questionnaire, very simple questionnaire. List what you know, the names of your, grand, your parents, your grandparents, your great grand, that's all we need. If we, you can get one level up, that's all we need. So if we have your grandparents at this point, we could find everybody else. But the more you give us, the easier, um, the easier it is. Yeah. Then we have three people full-time on staff. One is in uh, DC, one is in uh, Beaufort, um, South Carolina, and one is in Montana. And all they do is they do everything on their computer. They know where to look. The information is out there, but you, you, it's, it's not self-evident. It's easier than it ever was, but it's still not self-evident. Then, let's say if your um, ancestors were from um, Ukraine. We just, Michael Douglas is um, Michael Douglas's, he's in this season. I was just fishing for a guest, and then came up Michael Douglas. So then I have to go down and go down, who's Michael Douglas? On his father's side, Danielovich, the Danielovichs became the Dembskis, and the Dembskis became Douglas. How about that? And we traced his ancestry back to a shtetl in Belarus. Okay, and that was in the Pale of Settlement. The Pale of Settlement 
1791, Catherine the Great confined all the Jews in the Russian Empire um, to the Pale of Settlement. That's what it was called. Uh, the phrase beyond the pale, it didn't originate there. We think it originated in, in Britain. But it's the same thing, right? Beyond the pale. These were, yeah. and, the, the, and Jewish people, Ashkenazi Jews, lived there um, forever, from 1791 until the, till they finally um, escaped, which is why if you're Jewish, you have to have a DNA test. Tay-Sachs, mm -hmm. other genetic related diseases came from inbreeding. You were marrying your cousin because they were confined. So Michael Douglas's grandfather and his brother fled, <laughs> as it turns out, they were part of a criminal ring. And they came to the United States to, to avoid prosecution for crimes that they, <laughs> that they committed. Now, this is the most unusual immigration story, right? But it's the, it's the truth. This is on his father's side. Now, um, the three people working on their computers, one of them would find this, this story. Then we would either hire someone in the town or in the region, someone in Ukraine, who would then look at records that hadn't been digitized yet. Okay? Um, and there are always records that haven't been digitized yet. And in fact, I have made, personally made donations to get more um, Ashkenazi records digitized in Eastern Europe, which used to be the Pale of Settlement. I thought, when I started the series, I thought only black people didn't know their family tree. But nobody knows their family tree. And doing Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry is as difficult as finding our ancestors in in the, the abyss of, of slavery. Um, so then, so we have a two-prong attack. The generals at the computer, then we have people out in the field. And they're going through dusty, musty archives that haven't been digitized, and then we put it together. And then the third level is your DNA. And we have the world's greatest uh, genetic genealogist, C.C. Moore, and if you haven't read anything about her, um, she's a genius. I mean, she really is. Um, Google CECE -E Moore, The New Yorker, three years ago, December. And they did a profile um, of her. Um, we've been together 10 years. I went to a conference in California, and one of the panels was on genetic genealogy. So what's that? And I was waiting. Um, for the car to take me to the airport to fly back to Boston. And I looked at the program, and this woman, Cece Moore, was speaking about the wonders of genetic genealogy. And I said, what the hell? I'll, you know, I'll check it out. And when I was a kid, I wanted to be a doctor, right? So I'm not like many humanists. I'm not science phobic at all. I'm very comfortable in science. It took me a long time to give up the idea of becoming a doctor, right? So. And my brother's an oral surgeon, so that checked the box of my family. <laughs> when I was growing up, the smartest thing you could be, all smart little color boys and color girls are supposed to grow up and be a doc. From my mother, God rest her soul, in heaven, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and a medical doc. Because <laughs> <laughs> you would be rich and do some good, in that order, as far as my mother was concerned. <laughs> End of parentheses. So, I listened to um, this talk 10 years ago, and it blew my mind, and I realized that we could revolutionize finding your roots if, if I could persuade this woman to work with us. And we were in a Sheraton hotel or something like that where, you know, when the restaurant is dark and they don't turn the lights on until lunchtime, and asked her if she would go in there. Her husband was there and their little boy, and I hired her on the spot. Wow. And then I have a, my own... I have a production company called Inkwell Media, named for the black section of the beach, as everybody here knows, in Martha's Vineyard. And um, Dylan McGee, who's a woman, write her name, uh, Dylan, and owns McGee Media, and we own our products. You know, we own all our, our films, and we're, yeah. you know, we're partners. So I called her on the way <laughs> to the airport, and I said, you sitting down? She said, well, how did the conference go? I said, great. And I just hired a woman named Cece Moore, who's a genetic genealogist. She said, what? You had no authority to do that. What is a genetic genealogist? I go, shut up. You got to trust me. It's done. There's nothing you can do about it. Two weeks later, we flew Cece and her husband and little boy 
to Brooklyn, where our offices were at that time. And I made the producers. A lot of these producers went to very good schools and studied English or history, and not even film. So there were a lot of humanists, or, and now more and more people are going to film school. And I went through the carols, and I plucked them out, and I go, get your ass in there and listen to this lecture. And they did, and they, she got a standing ovation. Because when I started, so I don't want to blast off, but that is how we go about yeah. analyzing everyone's family tree. Sometimes it takes six weeks. Sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes the longest anyone's waited is five years. Wow. And we had to wait. There was a DNA mystery. And to solve it, somebody, like maybe in this room, had randomly to spit in the test tube. And that solved the, the thing. That's just how the network, the DNA network works. Isn't that amazing? That's just amazing. Kerry Washington, many of you saw Kerry Washington's story. She was very, very nice about <clears throat> my role in the complicated uh, uh, um, case of paternity. Before COVID, a lot of the people that we film live in LA, obviously, because they're celebrities, right? So before COVID, I used to stay at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Now I stay in, in Airbnbs, because I, I didn't want to die. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not Good quite point. ready for that. Yet. I miss my mother, but not that much. <laughs> not that you know much. <laughs> I didn't mean that, Mama. I didn't mean that, Mama. I'm still afraid of my mama. <laughs> and I walk out the door of the Beverly Wilshire, and there's Carrie Washington, who's like drop dead gorgeous. You know, I'd never met her before. And she had written an ass to be in the series. And she called me Dr. Gates. I don't like people to call me uh, Dr. Gates because, as my brother's, you know, has that proper uh, title. And because if I'm on an airplane and you're in seat 18C and you're having a heart attack, <laughs> and if they come, come and get me, I'm just going to say, look, tell my mama hi when you cross <laughs> over. <laughs> I'm not going to help you. I do not want to give anybody a false assurance that I'm going to be able to help them. And I'm not going to give you mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, resuscitation. <laughs> I'm not going to do any of that stuff. You know? <laughs> so, so she said, Dr. Gates, and she still calls me Dr. So, Dr. Gates, would you call my parents? Because they won't let me be in your show. And I said, why? And she said, an aunt did something scandalous. And you know how old black people are, she said. And I said, yep, I've been an old black person myself. And I've been old and black both for a long time. <laughs> and um, she said, nobody cares what this aunt did. You know, it's like she had a baby on the way. You know, but yeah. it turned out it was, that wasn't the reason. So she gave me um, her parents' phone number, and I called them. And um, her father said to me, Dr. Gates, if Carrie takes a DNA test, and I take a DNA test, and I'm not her biological father, will that be revealed? <laughs> I go, oh, yes. <laughs> it's your will, sir, <laughs> Mr. Washington. <laughs> and I went like, whoa, what is going on here? This has nothing to do with some putative aunt. And I said, um, <laughs> I said, is there anything you want to tell me? <laughs> and they said, she was conceived through artificial insemination. And I went, holy mackerel. When I started the series, ladies and gentlemen, I was just trying to help Oprah find what tribe she was from in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> We're not supposed to say tribe anymore, ethnic group, ethnic group in Africa. Yeah. And I had no idea that the technology would evolve. It didn't exist. Yeah. 23andMe, Ancestry.com, Family Tree, DNA, none of those exist. I started in 2006 and I only did black people, as right. you know, and a lot of the black people here now. Um, and then the, as these companies uh, came into being, they contacted me. A lot of geneticists contacted me and said, look, you, you're sitting on a gold mine. You have this huge audience. Can we float different technological advances yeah. through you. And th so the whole concept of DNA cousins. First time anybody ever heard about it was in 2009 when we did our first, as it were, multicultural show. It was called uh, Faces of America. And uh, uh, 
that's when we introduced DNA Cousins. And the reason we um, expanded the brand, as you know, they might say on Wall Street, is because I did uh, African American Lives in 2006. Nobody knew if it was going to work. PBS gave me zero money. I had to go raise all the money uh, myself. I had to raise six million dollars. And you know how I raised six million dollars? I got Oprah Winfrey to be in the series. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you do it. Quincy Jones, a friend of mine, and Quincy's best friend is Oprah. And Quincy has a 22,000 square foot house in Bel Air Place. And one whole wing, only Oprah can go in. Only Oprah can, you know, sleep there. Quincy scored the music for Roots, which <clears throat> most of us don't know. And he introduced me to Alex Haley. And all I'm doing is Alex in the test tube, right? So um, I got the idea of, I had been interested in uh, my own family tree since I was nine years old. And my, grand, my father looked white, my grandfather looked white. Uh, my grandfather was so white, we called him Casper behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> and the day after we buried my grandfather, Edward St. Lawrence Gates, I know the date, July 3rd, 1960, I made my first family tree because I wanted to figure out how someone with my phenotype, my features, could be descended from someone who looked like a ghost, right? Who was so white, his skin was translucent, and he had straight hair, um, wow. et cetera. So I was obsessed for a long time with my own um, family tree. Yeah. And then, after 1977, when Roots aired, you could say I had a bad case of Roots Envy. I wanted to be like Alex Haley. Yeah. I wanted to know where in Africa. I had actually taken a year off from Yale, where I was an undergraduate, and lived in Tanzania working in a mission hospital because I was pre-med, you know, I was going to be yeah. a doctor. I then hitchhiked across the equator with a white guy who had graduated from Harvard. So I was very much into Africa. I was intrigued by Africa. I was um, fascinated um, with it. And in the year 2000, I got a letter from a geneticist saying, Dear Dr. Gates, have you ever seen Roots? And I was like, what kind of idiot is this guy? I think I've ever seen Roots. Everybody's seen Roots. He said, we can now do in a test tube what Alex Haley purported uh, to do with the paper trail. And would you be a guinea pig? You know, would you have your DNA analyzed? And I go, yeah. And he had no idea. His name was Dr. Rick Kittles. And he worked at Howard University. And he had no idea that I had this passion about my own family tree. Yeah. And I called him and begged him to come up to Cambridge. Told him I would pay him to do that. He came up, told me about the science, mitochondrial DNA, which we all inherited from our mothers. And it, it's an identical genetic signature, never changes, for, I mean, for a zillion years. So it makes it, if you think about it, a logical way, scientifically, to trace ancestry. And so we could trace on your mother's line where you came from Africa. Yeah. What I didn't know at that time is that the reason that it was more reliable for finding a black person's African roots is because 35% of all black men do not descend from a black man. 35% of all African American men in this room, in the NBA, in the NFL, in Philadelphia, in the United States, descend from a white great-great-grandfather because of slavery. Isn't that amazing? My Y-DNA goes right to Ireland. And many, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, does that sound like an ethnic group in Africa? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, I get, uh, he does my uh, mitochondrial DNA, and he told me where I was. It turns out it was all wrong, but that's another story. <laughs> Three, and that's in the year 2000. Three years later, I get up. I don't want to be indelicate, but I get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. And I'm standing in the bathroom, and I got the whole idea for Finding Roots. Wow. It was a gift from God. It's, I don't want to be romantic about it. I don't want to be mystical about it. But even now, I, I get, I'm sort of teary. I stood there with tears running down my face. The whole, I, I swear to God, if I hadn't had to go to the bathroom, I never would have <laughs> finding roots. 
Now I keep post-it pads in all of my friends. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Always have a red pen I grade my student's paper with. It's all yeah. ready. Because <laughs> if God wants to give me another idea, I'm ready. Hey, you know? when nature calls, answer the call. Yeah, I wish some stock, <laughs> some stock market ideas would have come up there, but you know, that was the idea. I swear I got the idea. And the next day I called Quincy. Quincy being a jazz musician, he's up all night. So you can't deal with Quincy until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I waited and I called him and I said, Q, what if I could do for you what Alex did for himself? He said, can you do that? I go, yeah. And he said, does it hurt? <laughs> and the answer really was yes, because this was early enough that you, to get a sufficient amount of tissue, Dr. Weil, she, she, my, my personal physician is here, old friend, um, you, at that time you had to take blood. Now, of course, you spit in the test tube. So I lied to Quincy. He said, does it hurt? I go, no, of course not, and it doesn't hurt. And he said, okay, I'll be in the, your show. And then his daughter Rashida, whose uh, mother was Peggy Lipton, member of the Mod Squad, mm -hmm. and you see her on commercials now, and she was on uh, Parks and Recreation, and was great, my student. Um, she, Rashida was my student, so I was, I was trying to kill time and not be so obvious about it. And I said, how's Rashida? How's your work? Do you have any, any new music coming out? And then I said, and we asked Oprah if she'd be in the show. <laughs> and he said, no. And I went, oh my God. And then he said, but I'll give you her secret name and address. It's 2003. And I hung up and I thought, damn, that's the coldest brush off. I, I've, I've been rejected before, you know, but write her a snail mail letter. That's what he told mm. me to do. And I went to bed and I said, this idea is not meant to be. Next day I got up and I wrote a snail mail letter to Oprah Winfrey and I went to Harvard Square, put it in the mailbox myself and I waited. And I didn't hear anything, nothing. Six months comes and goes, no, nothing. And I thought, well, so much for, you know, me and Alex Haley, <laughs> me beating Alex Haley to the punch, right? I was watching the NFL, I love watching football. It was Sunday, and I grade papers watching football. And my team wins. People get A's. <laughs> people don't. All right. <laughs> and, um, and Jeff Lurie is a very good friend of mine who owns okay. Philadelphia Eagles. Let me say that. Jeff and Christina, his first wife, who own the Eagles. So I'm rooting for the Eagles. Not my favorite team, but I'm here in Philadelphia. <laughs> so my cell phone rings and it's Quincy. And all his friends call him Q. So I go, Q, what's up? And a deep woman's voice said, Dr. Gates, it says Oprah Winfrey. I said, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I knew the answer was yes, and you know why? Because rich people do not call you with bad news. <laughs> Never. They never do. Yeah. Her assistant would call and say, Miss Winfrey got your letter. She's so sorry. It takes so long to get back to you. And she wishes you well, but no. And it was Oprah said, I'd be honored. Yeah. So then I had a series, right? Whoopi heard about it and begged, called me a million times and begged to be in it. So she was in it. And Ben Carson was my classmate at Yale. Um, so I asked Ben and, and uh, um, anyway, Chris yeah. Tucker. And so I walked into Johnson & Johnson and Pitt made my pitch. And the whole pitch was, how would you like the whole world knowing what ethnic group Oprah Winfrey's from and having that episode on TV associated with all the Johnson & Johnson products? Ladies and gentlemen, you see that ceiling up there? Imagine if the ceiling opens up and a giant ATM machine slowly. <laughs> he said, six million? Is that all you need? <laughs> and it was a big hit. Yeah. And it was called African American Lives. And then PBS said, you're on to something. We want you to do it again. Then they gave me some money. Yeah. And then I still had to raise the money. So this, this Uncle Remus tale is about to end, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, I did Tina Turner, because I had to think about Tina Turner since I was 10 years old. Um, Morgan Freeman, anybody who plays God and the president, you got to do his DNA. Right? <laughs> Maya Angelou, who's Oprah's best friend and a very good friend of mine. Chris Rock. 
and it just went through the roof. So then I get a letter from a Russian Jewish lady. Dear Dr. Gates, I've watched, I called the series African American Lives. I've watched both seasons of African American Lives. I've really enjoyed them, but I've decided, having watched them, that you're a big fat racist. Why do you only do black people? Why don't you do white people? Why don't you do a Jewish person like me, a Russian Jew? And I was flabbergasted. It had never occurred to me. My brand was, I do African, African American, Afro Latin American studies. That's what I do, I love. Um, and it had never occurred to me. I swear to God, that lady did me the biggest favor, one of the biggest favors of my life. And I called, Coca-Cola was one of my sponsors, and um, Oliver knows uh, Ingrid Saunders Jones was the president of um, the Coke Foundation, African American woman. And I called her, and I called her on her cell phone. And I said, Ingrid, I'm holding a letter from this Jewish lady who says I'm a racist. She goes, what? She said, hold, up, hold the phone. And I, I'm so, I was holding on and waiting for her to answer. And after you know, a minute or two, I said, Ingrid? And I thought the call had dropped. I go, Ingrid, Ingrid. And I was about to hang up and she'd say, in a whisper, she goes, I'm here, I'm here. I was sitting with all these white people. <laughs> 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 she said, now what are you talking about? She had walked all, she had been in an executive meeting, walked all the way down the corridor so nobody could hear. Hmm. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, I'm holding a letter from this lady who says I'm a racist because we only do black people. I said, can we do white people? You know, can we expand the brand? And she said, there was a, a pause and she said, I only have one thing to say to you, Skinner. And I said, what? And she said, there's a lot more white people drinking Coke than black people. <laughs> there it is. I took that as a yes. <laughs> Then I had the problem, of, how do you pick white people? You know, I know how to pick black people. I have to pick white, white people come in kinds. You know, like they're Jewish white people, Catholic white people, and Protestant white people. Then if you pick white people, you gotta pick Asian people <laughs> and Indian people. So I did, ladies and gentlemen, what you would do if you were in this situation. I picked up my Hebrew Bible and read the story about Noah and I picked two of each one. Two, of each. <laughs> <laughs> two Jews, two Catholics, two, you know, <laughs> two Asians. And it was, we called it Faces of America. And that's when we introduced DNA Cousins. Yes. And on Tuesday, I was on The View, and Whoopi was on The View. And Whoopi, as I said, was in African American Lives when DNA Cousins didn't exist. And I led off by saying, Whoopi, you have the distinction of being one of the few African-American families that got their 40 acres and a mule through the Southern Homestead Act. Her family got 104 acres in Florida in um, 1873, and they proved it by 1878. And I said, we didn't have DNA cousins. I'm here to introduce you to your DNA cousin, and it's Tony Gonzalez, the football player. Wow. And, you know, who's the commentator. And they, it was all set up, they had his picture, and everything, and all the women said they were on a hit on Tony Gonzalez, and they wanted <laughs> to come to the family reunion. But that's kind of the evolution yeah. of, of uh, the series. So that now, going back to Kerry Washington, we're, we're confronted with things that I never dreamed that I, I would be. Like, yeah. I have now an ethics protocol that I keep right by, I, I write in the kitchen, <laughs> much to my wife's annoyance. And I have all these files set up. And I have this ethics protocol, and when it comes up, I read from it literally. Um, one, to protect us legally, but two, ethically and compassionately. And I would say, you know, Oliver Franklin's my friend, I'd say, Oliver, we have uh, uncovered something in our research that is forever going to change your understanding of your family. Do you want to know or not? Now, as yeah. incredible as it might sound, yeah. Theoretically, I've been told some people will say no. No one's ever said no to me. Hmm. Then, the second question is, I would say, Tracy, the man you called your biological father is not your biological father. And that's when, you know, all kind of things. Yeah. Anger, tears, what? What, are you sure you absolutely, I'm 100% sure. More, I've only had that a couple of times. I've, more often, your father, the man your father called his father. That means your grandfather. That means your grandmother 
had an affair on, you know, cheated yeah. on your, your grandpa or yeah. something that happened. Yeah. Joe and Manganiello, I had to call and tell him that his grandfather was really a black man. He was, he was raised to be an Italian <clears throat> and his father was alive. Then I said, you had to call your father and tell him because it's not the Jerry Springer show. You know what I'm talking about? You, you can't, I don't want to kill somebody with a heart attack in their living room. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> only if you do those things. And then we had to test the father mm. because one le level up, we can get even more accurate DNA results. Yeah. And um, some people have dropped out and have they have really? said, and then we give them all the information and you know, no hard feelings because yeah. it's a heavy thing. It's, it's too much. And there's yeah. a prominent person who told, was telling his father, uh, who's 81 years old, that his father was not his father. Wow. Over Christmas, and I'm waiting to hear Yikes. if he's going to stay in, in the series um, or yeah. not. And Carrie um, will de now decide. Carrie Washington waited five years, and she decided we were never going to find the answer until so she published a memoir, and that's how the story's up. And now she's going to decide whether she still wants us to look or if she wants to do, you know, whatever. So it's interesting and it's rewarding and it's thrilling. And Joe Manganiello, you would think, you know, he'd look for the Italian in his DNA admixture and it wasn't there. I mean, where the Italian was, was African American. Yeah. And I had to call him and say, Joe, you know, your grandfather somehow was a black man. And he goes, what are you talking about? And then he said, you know, my father got darker in the summer and was always teased. And then he said uh, his father never attended his baseball games. His oh, Italian yes. father oh. never attended his baseball games. And you know that story? That story, which has been on TV, Joe's grandmother liked to play the numbers. And she was in the Boston. And uh, the pool hall was where you could go and play the numbers. And the pool hall was owned by three black brothers. So bingo. That's, that's the way it happened. There it is, yeah. And when his father was born, they moved all the way across wow. Boston, away from that pool hall. Yeah. What do you think it is about identity, be it our own or someone else's? I mean, because you really tapped into something with the show. What is it about identity that captivates us so much? The, uh, you know, the, the favorite class I've ever taken in my whole life was in the fifth grade. We did a world history class. I grew up in Piedmont, West Virginia, an Irish Italian paper mill town, halfway between Pittsburgh and DC, Allegheny Mountains on the Potomac River. Why in the world a fifth grade class there? In, in the white school, you know, schools integrated in my county in 1955 because there were so few black kids there that people could count. They also were in the basketball. Know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Even a racist knows the basketball team is going to get better if you got black people in the basketball. <laughs> so schools integrated a year before I started. Um, I started first grade, and in the fifth grade, we had an ancient history class. I, I still remember the book. I have asked antiquarians to find this book. It would be the treasure of my library. I mean. Forget Frederick Douglass, forget Phyllis Wheatley. I want this textbook because, you know, I'm Hammurabi and the, the laws and cuneiform writing and Nebuchadnezzar and, and Xerxes and Darius and all of that. Man, they were, that was like magic for me in the Temple of Delphi. And I visited the Temple of Delphi last summer. No, I'd been to Athens when I was 19 years old, but I never went to Delphi. And one of the mottos, there were, I think, about 150 mottos at the Temple of Delphi. And one of them, the most famous is, know thyself. And I believe that knowing about your ancestors is a way of knowing about yourself. One of my heroes was the great physicist, Cambridge physicist, Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. And he said, it is the past that tells us what we are. Without the knowledge of the past, we lose our identities. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about the universe, but I think that's true of each of, of us gathered in, in this room. Yeah. You're not yeah. confined or delimited by what your ancestors did, but you definitely are informed by what your ancestors did. Yeah. I actually believe <coughs> that our ancestors are suspended in a kind of a genealogical purgatory. 
And when our researchers find the vaults in which they're suspended, they open those vaults and they tell us their story. And more often than not, somehow, some of their stories have trickled down through the branches of your family tree and helped to shape who you are yeah. in ways that are inexplicable. Yeah. Often when people, there's a secret and nobody will tell the secret, but the secret is all over right. the family. As the Yoruba people in Western Nigeria have a, a, a proverb that I love. The corpse that you buried in your backyard last week is poking its toe through the soil today. <laughs> and that is an African version of Freud's The Return of the Repressed, right? Mm. When you think about it. Yeah. And so often, this horrible family secret, just boom, yeah. is there somehow. And, and when you tell people, they go, oh my God, you know, and they burst into tears. And yeah. It's, my, uh, how many of you watch Game of Thrones? All right, on my short list of my all-time favorite is uh, George R. R. Moore, the author who wrote the novels that um, Game of Thrones is based on. So George is, uh, uh, his grandmother was Irish, married an Italian. I call it an interracial Catholic school marriage, right? <laughs> and, so we go through his family tree, and I show him his admixture. And he, I have everybody read their admixture out loud. And he read his, and he looks puzzled. And I said, George, what's wrong with this picture? And he said, there's no Italian there. I said, George, look at the list again. What's there that shouldn't be there? He said, it says I'm 25% Ashkenazi Jewish. And he looked at me, and I said, George, your Italian grandfather, see, the story was, the Italian grandfather cheated on the Irish grandmother, ran away with a younger woman and moved to Florida. I said, George, your Irish grandmother had an affair with the Jewish guy. She cheated on the Italian grandfather. And we even went to Florida and did the DNA of this guy's family. And his Italian grandfather had nothing to do with George R. R. Moore. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And she had <clears throat> concocted this whole story, but she was the permanent suffering widow. And she was the one who, wow. would, who stepped out. Mm. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I've learned, ladies and gentlemen, there were a lot of people who were happily married and were faithful. But there were a whole lot of people who were not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm talking about every ethnicity, every background represented in this room. You know, you go, damn, and I look at the picture and go, whoa, that lady was step it out, boy. <laughs> well, we are, sadly, just about out of time, but what? I do want to ask you. I'm yes. just getting started. Although you, you... I'm awake now. <laughs> You've answered about eight of my questions, actually, which is great. But um, we're very excited about Gospel, which is premiering next month on WHYY on PBS. Right. Um, give us a little preview. You did a, a film on the black church. This one is gospel. Give us a little preview of what we can expect. I'm happy to. Uh, but the one thing I want to say about Finding Your Roots to wrap up, mm -hmm. why is it so popular? I think, one, we tell a good story. Um, but I think that people are hungry for stories that remind us of all that we have in common, both as Americans and as human beings, yeah. that there is so much divisiveness and so horribly nasty um, that we're, we're hungry for things that show us that we are all members of a common family. And the two subliminal, subliminal lessons of each episode of Finding Your Roots are one, we're all, we're, America's a nation of immigrants. Even our Native American sisters and brothers immigrated here 15,000 years ago, right? And Dr. King gave a commencement address that I love at Stanford. And he said, it's commonly said that we're a nation of immigrants, but we're also a nation of exiles. And I think that is a very important point. That we're, you know, if you were rich in Europe, you're not gonna come to the wilderness of Massachusetts. Yeah. <laughs> For what? To have turkey and, you know, learn about Thanksgiving? <laughs> you know, not gonna happen. <laughs> Everybody was fleeing something, poverty, persecution, you know, uh, whatever. 
So that we're a nation of immigrants, a nation of exiles, and at the level of the genome, we're 99.99% the same. And we need to hear that lesson more today than ever. Before. So, so gospel. very quickly, gospel. Um, w. E. B. Du Bois, first book was written. Um, no, your second book was published a dissertation. Second book is called The Philadelphia Negro, and one of the founding works in American sociology. Uh, done right here through the University of Pennsylvania, where he had an appointment. They didn't give him an office, but they gave him an appointment, which was a big, a big deal. He famously said that the black church is composed of three elements, the, the preacher, the music, and the frenzy. The preacher, the music, <laughs> and the frenzy. And I've been fascinated by the black church. I was raised in the, my mother's church was a black church. My father's an Episcopalian. Um, I joined the church when I was 12, made a deal with God to, if um, he didn't let my mother die, uh, I would give my life to Christ. And um, I don't like talking about it because it makes, me, it makes me sad. But I joined the church, and uh, my, uh, well, my mother went off to, ostensibly to die. She didn't die. On a Sunday night, I went up to pray in my room. I was 12 years old. And I made that deal with Jesus. And uh, three days later, my mother came home. So I was walking past, I was so happy. I was walking past the mirror and I went, uh oh, I made a deal with God. <laughs> you know, like, I, I got to join the church. <laughs> and so I sneaked away. And, you know, I'm in rural West Virginia and there were so few black people that there was um, a church in the county seat and a church in Piedmont, five miles away, and one preacher. So they would have the service in the county seat on Saturday afternoon mm -hmm. and our service on Sunday morning with the same preacher. So I hitchhiked five miles away on that Saturday afternoon and <laughs> I walked into the service. There were about 12 people there, ladies and gentlemen. The average age must have been 82 years old, right? <laughs> <laughs> and most of them were women, not all of them uh -huh. were women. And everybody knew who I was. I was a little Skippy Gates. And uh, they thought it was cool that I was showing up in church. And there's a part in the service where it's called the call to, to the altar. Mm -hmm. And the minister <laughs> said, if anybody would like to give their life to Christ, please come forward. And I stood up, and he said, Skippy, the toilet is back <laughs> over there. You know, like, <laughs> and I said, no, I want to join the church. You know? <laughs> because I had to. I was keeping my mother alive, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, so I, they, nobody could believe it, and they all got gathered around me, and they asked me five questions, I think, and I answered the questions. I do, I will. And I cried, and they all cried, and everybody hugged me. And um, then I hitch, hitch, hitchhiked home. And that was Saturday night, and we were, had our little 12-inch black and white TV. This is 1962, and we were watching Gunsmoke. Gunsmoke was on Saturday and Bonanza on Sunday. Is that right? I think, we could fact check that. Oliver fact checked that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, everybody in America was watching the same things. Right. I miss that, by the way. Yeah. I miss it. I think we lost something in terms of civic unity. When you can mm. just go and say, man, did you see what little Joe did on Saturday <laughs> night? You know, the days of three Chester channels, Mr. right? Mr. Dillon and all, yeah, all that <laughs> yeah. stuff. So <clears throat> my father always read the paper at night. And... <laughs> he would do the crossword puzzle. So he's doing the crossword puzzle. My brother Paul's five years older than I am. He was there, Mama was there, and we were all watching, um, you know, Gunsmoke. And I didn't know how to break the news, you know, like that I'd done this thing, because I knew that my parents were gonna flip out. My mother never went to church. My father's an Episcopalian, right? You don't even have to believe in God to be an Episcopalian, you know? Like, <laughs> 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 it's my church, but so I can speak from. You know. <laughs> so my dad says, you know, idly, my father says, Skippy, did you do anything <laughs> interesting today? And I said, yeah, I joined the church. <laughs> and they all jumped up, what? You did? <laughs> you did what? And I never told them why. I, I never told mm. my parents why. And yeah. 
I was in that church. It was a fundamentalist church for two years. Mm -hmm. I didn't play cards. In my family, the card playing. Bidwis, Canasta, everything. Bridge. Um, and I loved to play cards. I didn't dance. I loved to dance. Um, I didn't listen to rock and roll. Mm. I didn't go to the movies. And I was a, I've been a movie junkie my whole life. I did everything right. Yeah. And finally, my brother was in dental school. And he's, oh, I told you, he's an oral surgeon. And he came home and he said, this shit is ridiculous, quote, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I am taking you to a movie. And by now, I'm 14 years old. And it was a hard day's night, the Beatles. And he took me to this movie. And I enjoyed it so much. And I, I forgot myself. And then when we came out, it was a big blue sky. And I thought, oh my god, I thought a bolt of lightning was going to come down and like strike me dead. And I didn't want to give up my belief in God. I'm spiritual. You know, while people don't want to say they're religious. They go, it's a cool, I'm a spiritual person. But I am a spiritual person. And um, so I joined my father's church, the Episcopal Church. So I have been fascinated by the church since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, miraculous things, I think, happen. Um, I was terrified of the Pentecostal church. You know, people would get the Holy Ghost yeah. and, you know, uh, be possessed. But I was fascinated by it. The Methodist church that I joined was on this side of the street. This is in the black section of Piedmont. And the Holiness Church was on that side of the street. And when I turned the corner, I crossed over this side of the street because I didn't want to walk by the Holiness Church. I was afraid the Holy Ghost would snatch me. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't interested in that. I was spiritual, but I didn't want to be that spiritual. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I studied it. I read about it. I read, I know a lot about Yorba religion. At, when I went to graduate school, Wally Shoyinka, the great uh, Nigerian playwright who eventually got the Nobel Prize was my mentor. And I'm interested in African religion, African American religion, spirit possession, all those sorts of things. So I enjoy going to church, but I like going to church for the preaching and the music yeah. uh, and the magic of it. Yeah. And when you go back to Du Bois's three components, the preaching and the music, well, we did, um, as you said, a four-hour documentary on the history of the black church. Yeah. And the black church is at the center of the universe for black people. Frederick Douglass was a, um, um, probably ordained as an AME mm. um, minister. You know, they didn't have divinity schools to go yeah. to in the slave community. Um, but uh, so much of our culture is rooted in, in the church, and I wanted to tell that story. Yeah. And then, uh, after we did that, what was left over was gospel music. So this focuses on different preaching styles and the history of gospel music. And gospel, gospel was, you know, blessed assurance. This is my story. This is my song. It was written by a blind white lady, mm. Fanny Crosby in um, 1880, I think. You can fact check. Um, gospel was around, but black gospel was born in about 1921 mm. in Chicago with Thomas Dorsey. And Thomas Dorsey was Georgia Tom. He was a blues player. And he because of the great migration goes to Chicago. Mahalia comes six years later from New Orleans. Gospel is born in Chicago in the black church. And it is a, it's beautiful music. It is the, uh, if you take the spirituals that our enslaved ancestors created mm -hmm. and you add the blues and jazz, you get gospel, yeah. right? And so I wanted to tell that story because it's the music that I love. I don't like contemporary black religious music. I like gospel. gospel. I am an old school Negro. <laughs> I like gospel music. <laughs> well, we are excited for the premiere of Gospel. It'll be next month on WHYY. Please join me in thanking Dr. Henry Lewis Gates for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, also, before we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for Tracy. Thank you. Let me just take a moment to invite everyone to join us for dessert back outside in the hall. So we'll see you out there. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank Be you. safe getting home, but make sure you get some dessert first. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was oh, that was an absolute delight. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>
Yeah. Sure.